Rushwood Center at Ryerson Woods presents the 37th Annual Smith Nature Symposium. Rushwood Center is located in the Ryerson Woods Forest Preserve in Riverwoods, Illinois, and honors this land as the traditional home of the Council of Three Fires. Today, Brushwood Center continues to be a place where many people from diverse backgrounds find healing, vitality, and relationship with nature. You can learn more and support this work at brushwoodcenter.org. Now is the time to create a more resilient tomorrow. This year, the Smith Nature Symposium Series explores what it will take to build a more just and sustainable future in the aftermath of COVID-19. Welcome to the 37th Annual Smith Nature Symposium. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Danny Aboud. I am the Manager of Community Programs and Partnerships with Brushwood Center at Ryerson Woods. And thank you for, again, for joining us for this, our last uh, session of the Smith Nature Symposium before our final presentation with Bill McKibben and Sue Halpern on October 9th. Before we begin this session, um, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the injustice of the Kentucky grand jury decision yesterday, which brought no direct charges against three Louisville officers for the murder of Breonna Taylor. Brushwood Center, Brushwood Center firmly stands in solidarity with those who continue to fight for justice for Brianna, as well as her family, as they continue to deal with an unspeakable loss. Mm -hmm. I invite you to join me in a moment of silence as we honor and uplift Brianna Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Thank you for that uh, amazing introduction and an opportunity to say her name, Brianna. Um, and I, I really resonate with um, the introduction from our um, incredible leader, Bill Curtis, as he said, now is the time to create a more resilient tomorrow. Uh, and to really prioritize the things that we need to do individually and community-wise to nurture and sustain ourselves and our community and our world. And I am incredibly honored to, to moderate and be part of this panel with these two amazing individuals. I might just introduce them. It's um, Maria Smithberg, um, beautiful Maria, has she she humbly says she's had only 13 years of experience but we know that maria has actually <laughs> 30 plus years of experience in landscape architecture and uh, what maria seems to be particularly gifted in is um, true aesthetics the art and science of bringing landscapes um, to to people in urban environments to create that space that would then facilitate healing. And we're gonna hear from Maria first in just a moment for around one particular project uh, in Chicago that beautifully highlights this skill, this expertise. And I also get to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Bill Sturm, who has more than 40 years of experience in creating healing spaces. Um, I got to be a, a participant with Bill in creating one of those spaces and enjoying one of those spaces once it was created. And I must say, as I sit here in my Northwestern lab coat in my very unesthetic setting, um, how critically important it is that we pay attention to the environment in which we provide care, not just for those who are recipients of that care as patients, their family members, but also the people providing the care. 
I am tender um, as we have had more than 900 healthcare workers die during this pandemic. And most recently, um, a young woman, 28 year old Adeline Fagan, who was a second year um, ob resident in Houston. And we know that Texas does not support our please wear your mask person. Um, they have not been embracing that very important aspect of protection. And Adeline in the emergency department contacted, contracted COVID. And after two months of the most god awful experience in healthcare of ICU care ventilation, even to the point of where she was on something called ECMO, which is basically bypass, um, she died at 28. So we we reverberate in in the healthcare culture right now um, with the impact of this, not just from the standpoint of what it's done to our patients and families, but what it has done to us. So this is a very, very important topic. And finding opportunities to interact with nature and to be in environments that nurture and sustain us in the work that we do. So Maria, may I ask that you first provide us a presentation of your work and um, an example from the beautiful work that you did at Swedish Cup. Thank you so much. Uh, I have to get back to the techie things here. Right? Oh, you'll do, you'll do great. <laughs> well, I'm Maria Smithberg. I'm a landscape architect, and uh, I've been lucky to have lived in Chicago for now 30 years. And after many years practicing some parks and residentials, I was brought in to design a healing garden for the Swedish Covenant Hospital which of course for me was a challenge because I never did one, which meant that I did a lot of research and even to the point that I, I went to see which one of the first ones. Of course, the first ones are way back to the Middle Ages, but now in our country, it was Frederick Law Olmsted, the creator of Central Park, who designed also healing gardens for hospitals. And nature was brought in because nature, as we all know, is a solace for healing, which is good for the mind and it's good for the soul and it's good for the body. So the first slide just show you things that we, we crave or nature. This was a lucky day with a rainbow. Nature <coughs> and water and the seasons throughout the, 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 the year, the, the sunsets, the water, the beautiful the beautiful landscape, and um, this is in my country of Uruguay, which I treasure. And this is our site, our challenging site, as you can see from the parking lot to the <coughs> hospital. Okay, okay. Um, Sorry. Um, uh, this is a site that had um, just the buildings, the gymnasium, the hospital itself and just what I will call a cow path to reach the hospital. Not a very exciting place to walk every day back and forth, not only by the medical uh, professionals there, but the nurses and the family of the patients and, and other patients. So as you can tell in, Chica in Chicago, in this particular part of the city, you're not supposed to send the water out into the sidewalk. So I had those, uh, uh, drains for the water collection that I couldn't change. So I have to create something that will sustain water. And this was the first, the, the design that I came up with that has a, a metaphor for water and a metaphor for, for healing. As we know, our bodies are composed pretty much 70% of water and water is uh, healing because it gives us life. Without the water, we couldn't survive or sustain life of any of any plant material. So in this particular uh, plant view, if you can all see it, that's the, I don't know if I can show it to you, but there's a path, but I, the old cow path, and I transformed this space into a, a metaphor, a wound. So the wound is like the water uh, and the horizontal lines are the healing hearts, the, the hands of the doctors, the hands of family and loved ones that come and reach out to you to heal. So that transformation of a space, in fact, is also a metaphor for healing. 
And these are my little sketches showing the evergreen hedges interfering and reaching out to the paved area and the water with the pebbles, my little sketches. And this is during construction. Quite a big difference between uh, the, the final stage, as you could see. It was a playground on the left and two buildings on the front and the right. And this was during construction time. The hospital is in the far back. You can see all the windows of all those patient rooms look into this space. So it's very important for the hospital it was such a much needed space. And this is the beginning of the transformation with the pebbles and the rocks simulating uh, the wound, psychological or physical. Although I couldn't have water per se because it's always a maintenance issue, but also it can be a heaven for mosquito breeding. But on a rainy day or when there's a lot of water in Chicago, like we saw this past spring, it really fills with water for a while. And, and those are the bandings on the pavers, the birch trees, the hornbeams during construction. That's in the beginning of the, in the, in the summertime. And also the trees help you shield the building. So instead of, it's really like a transformation of the built environment into a little oasis that it was so much needed in this particular place. It's not only used for people that go to the hospital. A lot of people just make a point of walking through there just to see uh, an oasis in the middle of the streets and traffic on Foster and California Street. The water feature, yes, we, we, this, we had this water feature, which is lovely because it's very subtle. It reflects the garden and creates sound, which is also very appealing for healing. These are little details in the spring. Here's the camassia bulbs, the ferns coming up. So it's not so much about color and, you know, because it's very peaceful. I think in the summer, it's more green because we want to create that feeling of, of peacefulness with just textures of greens. And in the fall and in the spring, we had more color. This is the beginning of the fall. We have lovely trees with golden colors and red colors. Here you have the birch trees that have that beautiful bark. Because when you have winter in Chicago, we almost have six months of winter. I really have to think about structure and what has color in the winter. And certainly the birch trees have that and the trunks and branches of the, some of the shrubs as well. This is in the winter. So it's very exciting too, because this, the banding is dark granite and so are the boulders. So you get that almost like chiaroscuro, black and white transformation of, uh, of, of this garden. Here's again the view facing the buildings. That is an emergency exit that we have to keep, but it became a bridge. And then little vignettes of the flowers. These are the, in the late summer, the anemone silvestris. This is the liatris. You can see the water, I pick up that stone in particular because it had a bowl effect and not only collects water, but the kids like to use it and just play with it and see whether they can hit the bowl or not with their, with their little pebbles. People find different places to sit. Those granite boulders are, are really places to find a seating within the garden. Some places are more private than, than other ones. So it's, it's a place for everybody to be in community or in intimacy. This is a labyrinth that kids also love, provides a place for meditation that is so much needed as well, and the kids love to find their way out. This is a child and a mother. And again, kids finding a place to, so actually within the, the area, the green areas, the kids do, uh, the, the, there's some, uh, patients that do Tai Chi and there's classes of Pilates. So it, it's really used. There's some yoga classes too as well or meditation. And there has been instances where there has been also even like weddings or picture taking. So it's widely used not only by the hospital but also by the community which find this place a little jewel in the middle of this urban city. And thank you so much.
Maria, that was, even in photography, um, really felt good. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you're right, because I forgot to say that even in these um, particular times of COVID, uh, having been able to go to a place and breathe nature and don't take for granted the air you breathe. I mean, it felt very good. People were like even more grateful yeah. because they had a, a nice place to be and enjoy nature, which mm -hmm. in certain areas of the city, you can find it. Yeah, yeah. So I am extraordinarily grateful for what you did. Thank you. And um, Bill, I'm gonna turn to you. I wanna segue into this to just say that, um, you know, like many healthcare folks, I got introduced to this whole idea of spaces and healing through Ulrich's work and his uh, post-operative study in gallbladder surgery and that people who could look out on nature healed physically more quickly, discharged more quickly, needed less medication for pain. And certainly we've seen more and more in my beloved colleague, Terry Horton, and her work with diabetes demonstrating that. So Bill, let take it away and talk to us about physical spaces and your work and how you have exemplified this. Thanks, Martha. Um, great work, by the way, Maria. Thank you. Uh, I, I am a principal, I'm an architect, principal with Three and Storm Architects. And uh, as Martha knows, our practice is focused on environmental design for more than three decades, yet, I consider myself far from an expert on healing spaces. Uh, rather, I'm a passionate student. And mm -hmm. my favorite teacher, I guess, is a, a, a fellow by the name of Bill Browning, who was Brushwood's 2011 uh, Smith Symposium keynote speaker and the founder of Terrapin Bright Green. Uh, I think Catherine and Danny are going to provide links to that because there's several free studies on the topics that I'll discuss. And he's been a close friend of mine for 25 years. You know, health is such an, a massive concept, uh, particularly as a species, we better recognize the synergy between the environment and human activity. And as individuals, the influences of exercise, nutrition, and mindfulness. In 2008, Martha, when you were critiquing the impact of our design, of a hospice unit on its patients, I was introduced to the Japanese practice of forest bathing by Bill. We walked in our woods and he explained forest compounds we were inhaling to improve our health. He discussed the connection between people and nature he termed as biophilia. And we dreamed of possibilities of biophilic design or designing with thoughtful connections to nature to positively support folks in our buildings and our sites. Next slide, please. Later, Bill and Terrapin defined 14 patterns of this biophilic design, which basically can be grouped into three headings. And one should consider when designing space, and they are nature in space, and that's basically naturally occurring experiences like views to beautiful landscapes, sounds of birds, tastes and smells of plants, enjoyments of breeze and movements of water, changes of the season, or simulated like green roofs or artwork or aquariums. There's also number two natural analogs. That's examples are being like organic forms, natural materials, exposed structures, or experience of complexities or order that are found in nature. And lastly, Number three, the nature of a space. These are best described as feelings such as openness or safety or retreat or anticipation or threat. Next slide, please. You may ask, what the heck does this have to do with health? Well, read the small print. Okay, not possible. So I'll interpret it for you. Over the last three decades, Studies of analyzing our responses to each of these patterns have been conducted. And the empirical data compiled provides a window into the positive impact that design that thoughtfully uses our connection to nature has on one, psychological health. Oh, that's the three. Physiological health, one, which is lowering blood pressure, slowing our heart rate, lessening stress. 
Two, cognitive performance, such as making us more productive, helping us focus, keeping us um, attentive, uh, refreshing our memory, and lastly, psychological health, such as improving our mood, heightening pleasure and quite tranquility, and giving us better perspective to support happiness. Next slide, please. This topic of biological response for me first hit home regarding an incident at Ryerson Woods Welcome Center that we designed just a stone's throw, throw away from Brushwood Center. Nan Buckard, the Director of Environmental Education for the Lake County Forest Preserves, called me about a surprising comment received during an exit interview. A relocating staff member with what she described as acute chemical sensitivities requiring da daily medication found she didn't have to take that medication when working at the Welcome Center. Now to achieve a well, uh, the Welcome Center's LEED Platinum rating from the United States Green Building Council, we paid particular attention to air quality. This basically meant specifying natural materials and finishes that would not off gas and separating continuous ventilation with energy recovery from heating and cooling system. So one might ask, was this response a result of these strategies or a response from the connections to nature because of view outdoors, airflow, abundant natural light, natural materials and forms, maybe even feelings of refuge and mystery, a comp or lastly, a complex of both, combination of both? Well, that's my bet. Next slide, please. A few years later, we were privileged to design another facility for the Lake County Forest Preserve known as Greenbelt Cultural Center. We again delved into the direct connection between natural systems and the built environment. Working with Alan Dawlington and his company Nedlaw, we installed for the second time in the United States a living wall. Despite being a beautiful, ever-changing natural artwork and providing acoustic absorption for few rooms of assembly, these vertical walls of plants use their root system to bioremediate the air from being stale to becoming fresh before being reintroduced, reintroduced back into the ventilation system. This allowed us to reduce the outside air by 50% and the cost of treating and conditioning that outside air. A secondary welcome surprise was a wonderful sound of computer controlled irrigation for these plants that could be heard during the room's less active times. So again, one might ask, was this fresh air feeling a result of these strategies or again, a response from connections to nature via view, light, sound, natural artwork, or a complex combination of all? Next slide, please. Another client, Jay Tudhill, mentioned to us that the community space with associated outdoor patio to a pedestrian pier into their pond was a big hit for the employees and visiting trainees. So while he valued and welcomed the pioneering energy saving features such as displacement ventilation system, which allowed employees to customize their HVAC supply at each workstation, the real win was the building's amenities that attracted and retained talented employees often sought by larger, better known corporations. One might ask, was the attraction of this facility a result of adaptable HVAC and lighting system, thoughtful amenities like coffee stations, breakout rooms and vaulted ceilings, or a view to a restored prairie? the sound of the stairs water fountain feature masking office noise, rich natural materials, solar controlled electric lighting, or was it again a combination of all? Guess where I'm heading. Next slide, please. To this day, we continue to work with Prairie Crossing Charter School which often receives the highest ranking for elementary schools in Lake County. Parents, board members, and patrons, Vicki and George Rainey, were early embracers 
of the positive powers of nature on student health and performance. Might you ask, were the school's achievements the result of strategically placed windows to naturally light ceilings to reduce computer screen glare or radiant heating in the floors for student comfort or natural views for class into classroom gardens, operable windows paired with operable clear story windows to provide natural ventilation, natural materials such as bamboo floors, and most importantly, an immersive environmental cur curriculum. I suspect it was a combination of all. Next slide, please. Martha, this project is near and dear to our hearts. But the League Gold rated Marsha, Fam Marsha Family Hospice Pavilion is a regional independent hospice and palliative care center in Glenview. Its design was a rich study of stewarding critically ill patients and thoughtful building systems and amenities paired with a healing garden conceptualized by staff from Scott Byron Company and the Chicago Botanic Garden. Were later gratifying notes of thanks from families of patients the result of controls at patients' beds to adjust lighting, window shades and music, a low velocity displacement air ventilation to avoid drafts, pull out beds for guests to stay or a cooking kitchen with dining facilities for a visitor's use? Or was it the connection to nature via panoramic views from four stories up, balconies for patients to enjoy the sun and the air, natural materials, and room adaptability for patient retreat or inclusion? Again, I think it's a complex combination of all. Next slide, please. As architects, we have been blessed, that pun is intended, to have designed many a worship space. One such facility, Holy Spirit Catholic Community in Naperville received an International Faith and Forum Award for its liturgical interiors. However, my favorite space was its rather modest Eucharistic devotion chapel. NIA Studio, in Michigan suspended the Eucharistic reserve in glass within a bay of glass that we located in a private garden. One felt a world apart and in their own world as they prayed. So I won't ask because I know. That feeling of tranquility, peace, concentration, and spiritual health was a result of direct connection to nature. By actually being within nature, it had everything to do with architecture and frankly, nothing to do with architecture. Next slide, please. So as we occupy, maybe even design our homes, particularly during this time of sequestering indoors, we should be attentive to our biological needs by including nature in our lives. This connection pays much stronger dividends than that third garage stall or the jacuzzi in our master bath. Unfortunately, we spend 90% of our time indoors, yet with a little planning, the line between indoors and outdoors can be blurred. Next slide, please. Tools to actually or subliminally invite nature indoors or maybe locate habitable space outdoors or many. Some might be blur the line between the built and natural environment. Bring in indoor plants with their curvy lines and brilliant colors and oxygen producing characteristics. Install natural art that triggers emotional responses found when in nature. And note, I inserted a beautiful painting from he Young Kim, Brushwood's resident artist. Or put up a small trickling fountain with its soothing sound. Maybe even more techie products, 
like a recently unveiled ceiling fan that changes airflow upon occupancy and disinfects the air that moves through its blades with ultraviolet light. Or just filtering continuous ventilation systems in our house that are separated from our heating and cooling system. Last slide, please. As architects and as people, it is critical that we protect the health of this planet as for ours is directly dependent upon it. Our non-renewable consumption habits are testing this nation's prosperity and unduly penalizing the well-being of those less fortunate. If we work harder together, include nature as a sta stakeholder, explore the mysterious, mysterious and wonderful interconnections of activity and place, the prescription for our health and its planet and our planet can be rewritten in a very exciting way. Years ago, I went on a family vacation after a day of sightseeing with my then preteen daughter. She started profiling, profiling the difficulties of young life. And then she stopped and looked at me and said, Dad, you're great. You're quiet, you listen. And you forget everything I said five minutes after I say it. Hopefully, what I said has some value and so is retained. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. You know, I, I was reflecting through both of you spoke about air, <laughs> air and light, air movement um, and natural light. And I think I'd like to explore that with you a, a bit about, uh, obviously when we are outside in, in natural landscapes, the opportunity to breathe <laughs> is much enhanced. And then also Bill, you pointed out some of the ways that you create that sensation or that experience internally. And as a physician, I will tell you that probably one of the most distressing symptoms that people can experience is to be short of breath or to perceive that their work of breathing is greater than they can sustain. It, it's a vicious, vicious symptom because it worsens as one becomes more aware of it. So Maria, can you speak a little bit about um, air and airflow and how do you are you intentional as you create a space as to how that would be oops you're you're muted i gotta unmute you now yeah you're good uh, yeah especially when you're adding so many trees and plant material you're changing the, the temperature of the place certainly and you're adding the wildlife, the butterflies come, the birds come, and it just, that in itself and the, sen the sensorial qualities, you have the smells of certain plant cells, so that increases the quality of the air. It, it, it just like cuts back on the, the pollution that was there. There's a parking lot nearby, there's a street nearby. So it's almost like a filtering system mm -hmm. that we created. And, uh, and so it's much better to go and, and take a stroll in that garden that to go down on the sidewalk. So it changes, yeah. it changes uh, extremely your stress level, your hormones levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And Bill, you know what I'm really struck with, because you touched on it and also grew from it, how much technologic <laughs> work there is around air. Yes, you know, I think air can, in the built environment, in, at least interior spaces in my mind, it gets categorized in two areas, the, perceive, the perception of it and then its reality. And when I say perception, a lot of times in buildings you have windows and if you can open them, mm -hmm. they're really not extensively ventilating a space, but our perception is, is that there's this comfort of mm -hmm. fresh air that mm -hmm. we can access. The, the, the more actual realities are, are like, for, I mentioned the ceiling fans, you can, the, the movement of air 
is like um, the fluttering a leaf of a tree. It keeps us um, alert, I guess is the best way. And you can change temper. Your, your, your temperature range can, on a ceiling fan, you could be setting your thermostat at 75 and feel like it's 72 inside because the air movement across your body is that wonderful cooling sensation. And lastly, the real actuality is that we do need to ventilate our spaces a great deal. You know, in, in schools, for example, most of our schools were old window opening ventilated space. Mm -hmm. they, then they were later on air, air conditioned, those windows were closed and there's not terribly good ventilation in them. Mm -hmm. And and so what what we're doing is, are, and not just us, many, many, um, design professionals is separating the ventilation completely from the thermal control. So that ventilation system is constantly on, constantly exchanging air in a building, exchanging the energy as well. But if somebody gets too hot, shuts down the, the uh, thermostat, it's not changing the quantity of air that you're getting. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a health reason. Lastly, they did come up with uh, studies where, the, this was the U.S., um, uh, Department of Health, where they just increased the ventilation in schools, doubled it. And they and compared the cost of doing so and the performance of those schools over a couple of years period. And I think, I don't know the specific percentages, but I do remember the cost went from $20 a student to $40 a student per year, and their performance levels were in the double digit in, in hmm. improvement. So. Well, you know, physiologically, um, there are studies that show that the movement of air, particularly on the second branch of the trigeminal nerve of one's face, is more effective at treating shortness of breath than providing oxygen through a nasal cannula. Wow. So if you're not hypoxic, if you actually don't have an oxygen deficit, but you perceive yourself as short of breath, which can happen, right? You're in an elevator or you have a disease that's causing pressure within your chest. You can feel short of breath, even though you're receiving significant enough oxygen. But if you put a fan on someone's face, <laughs> and I, I reflect too, Maria, what you said about, and Bill, you said it too, plants moving, things, um, the sense of movement and airflow is likely also calming. Yes. There's a question that popped up in our Q and A. How do we do? How do we incorporate some of what we're talking about? These the garden at Swedish Covenant in Chicago, the amazing work of architect. How do we make sure that we can bring some of this into the space in which we live at home, so that we're more intentional about? that type of healing environment where we spend even potentially more of our time? Well, in my case, because I'm a landscape architect, my kitchen, my dining room, my living room is full of plants. Mm. And they're doing very well. I think they, they like, I think because my windows don't open because I live in the 60s floor. So I think that those plants inside really helps purify uh, the air that is coming from the air conditioner and all that, I think is, for me, is very important. And the fact that they're healthy, including the orchids and things like that, they come back and six months later, they start blooming again. I think that I must be doing something good with the air because <laughs> plants are survivors. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's my personal experience. It's, it's in I, I, love, I love Bill's... Um, um, indoor uh, living living wall with plants that that mm -hmm. is a, it's a challenge to do it outside but maybe it's a great idea to have it inside more restaurants should have it for mm -hmm. <laughs> acoustics and air and everything i mm -hmm. agree yeah. you know it's funny uh martha i was thinking this and Maria was speaking that we too are uh one of those images is from our home and we have uh i think I, last time i counted because i was reading a tribune article 70 plants in our house mm -hmm. i got got to, and that was it's very invigorating and then when i got to about 80 or we gail and i got to 80 it got to be stressful so <laughs> I, I, had, I had to pull back you know um so you know there's this there's this 
common ground that you found find with these wonderful living creatures. And then, yeah, yeah another thought came to my mind, a, a building scientist that I've known for, gosh, decades, um, who used to say, dilution isn't the solution to pollution. And the re reason he would say that is, don't put stupid stuff in your house and then try to ventilate it out. You know, be careful, be thoughtful about how you finish things and insert things. And, and um, Gail and I were a little bit on our home and, and I think it proved out over the long term to, to benefit, to be a benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's so many, you know, when you'd speak and, and then I will I'll try to step back, but as architects, a lot of times, and as people, certainly, we just have to be quiet and, and listen to what's around us and see what is around us. And then buildings and landscapes often start designing themselves. And mm -hmm. I, I think we've heard that a lot, but I don't know if we're humble enough sometimes to really do it. And that is to watch where the sun comes in or watch our patterns. When we take a shower, do we want it to be morning sun or evening sun or, you know, and, and create places that best serve us, not what our neighbor think is cool, you know, in that respect. So. Mm, that's powerful. Uh, they want you to say one more time that wonderful dilution is not the <laughs> By the way, that's, that's a guy named Joe Stebrook with Building Science Corporation, who is a brilliant and irreverent building scientist. <laughs> uh, but his statement was, dilution is not the solution to pollution. Mm -hmm. And and it is a mechanism to reduce it, but not to get rid of it. And obviously, that is, let's be thoughtful about what we put in buildings. Mm -hmm. So I'd love each of you to reflect with me. What? How do you define healing? What if someone you're you're creating healing spaces? You're creating healing gardens. What what is healing? Maria, what, when you hear that word, what do you think of? I mean, I, I mean, you can almost say that it's, it's a word that is being abused now because there's a place that I go here in Colorado and it's called True Nature Healing Arts. So, I mean, it, but when you go there, you really feel just by entering the space, there's a certain atmosphere. The gardens are amazing. It's about yoga, but it's also about treatments. And... It's about people too. I think people, I think people that love plants uh, and do gardening in general are very generous. You know, they share the seeds, they share their their solutions to a problem plan. And I think being in in, in gardens that you you learn from nature, it's in itself a healing process. You're learning from other nature. I know that she can be very cruel sometimes, but she always mm -hmm. comes back victorious. So for me, healing, I know that doctors can heal but i mean i go back to the basic which is look at nature to heal like my dad will say go to the grocery store they are your vitamins eat the rainbow so I, I i come from that school of thought you know that the mm -hmm. healing starts first in how you treat your body how good you are to your body mm -hmm. and of course medical professionals assist you but first be good to your body mm -hmm. bill what do you think well, Martha, you set us up because this is a healing professional talking, asking, you know, an architect about healing. <laughs> um, but I have to say the first thing that came to mind was a little bit the similar notion of energy efficiency. I think we as over the, the decades have looked at it as austerity. And I've always looked at it, and I mean this genuinely, as potential, possibilities. And healing to me is, you know, there's a kind of a big word in architecture right now, it's called restorative design. And healing to me is potentially uh, opportunity, not to solve a problem, but set up a potential for the future to, to restore, to make things stronger. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, that's where we've got, well, we, that's the way I'd like to think that I can look at things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think of healing and not just me, but people who have written on it. I, 
I don't equate healthcare necessarily with healing. Um, I think we have the potential, just as you said, but we also have the potential to cause distress. Healing comes from the root word of holy, same word as holy or whole, and the idea behind it is to make whole again. And obviously our bodies, <laughs> as I often say to people, because I spend my time caring for folks with far advanced illness, is that our bodies are frail, they're fragile, and our chassis get tired. And though we might make them whole, the value of duct tape per se, um, we can't fully, I love that word, Bill, restore. But our spirit within the chassis has the opportunity to heal, irrespective of what happens to our fragile beings, our bodies that can only sustain us for a lifetime. <laughs> our spirits are, are much more, res that's really what we're working to create resiliency, right? And the work that you both do and those like you to help create that space in which that potential can be realized is profound. Uh, it just, um, you know, for so long within healthcare, we have, particularly back in the 70s, as healthcare technology really started to take off, we started to build to house our technology, right? <laughs> it was more important that our MRI was in the right place, <laughs> or our CAT scan, or our labs, and we lost. Uh, the priority of what is the space in which the people receive the care. The, so the whole idea of hospitals, places of safety and hospitality and the solariums of Europe um, with openness and windows that opened and sunlight and, and such like that. I think of Thomas Mann's book, The Magic Mountain, you know, putting folks in a solarium we got away from that. And now I feel like we have an opportunity to regrow in our attention. If you were to give a charge as far as where you see some needs and opportunities within healthcare, maybe Bill, start off with you. What do you think are some short-term solutions and some long-term solutions to where we are? What needs to be done? I think, there's discipline always in our efforts and uh, I have not, our firm and I have not gone through this process, but there's a rating system called the wellness rating right out oh. there. And, and now it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's for buildings, but it has categories like nutrition mm -hmm. or uh, mindfulness. Mm -hmm. It's starting to connect the web out there of what makes a building really uh, perform and healthy. And I think, you know, uh, hospitals or, or uh, healthcare facilities, gosh, if that isn't down there alley, what is? Mm -hmm. And and then the, the other thing is um, the, the notion that uh, these facilities uh, should, um, oh, I don't know, m maybe it's the environment in general, but there's an equity out there that, that uh, we always have to continue to work towards um, equity of the, those folks we serve and um, the, the, the spaces and the, uh, that they can access and the environment around them. So um, that would be two comments that I would have. Mm -hmm. Maria, what do you think? Um, I was just thinking, you know, uh, now during these last four or five months, whatever, of the COVID, that a lot of people have been working remotely and, and I, I, a lot of times very successfully, uh, even more like um, more accomplishing more than in the office space. And if you think about the typical office space that you're hours sitting at your desk and you're with artificial light, um, I think there's something to be said that perhaps you think, okay, oh, I'm not going to be efficient at home, but at home you can open the window, maybe you can work outside. Mm -hmm. And I think that it may change the way we see work and, and, um, and productivity throughout the day. I'm lucky because I'm outside all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm a landscape architect, so I have to be outside, but I, 
I, I, I noticed that a lot of people feel very good working remotely because it could be in any other place that you're happy and it has the nice uh, environment to work with. So maybe there's something to be said about that, how we can uh, improve our environment through that. And I think also through education, a lot of the young kids, I, I, I did a project once, a park in Chicago, and we invited all the public, certain public schools in the, in the inner city places to come and have lunch with us. And the teachers were telling me that some of these kids didn't know what an apple looked like or a banana looked like. And I was like, what? So it, it, educating the kids at a young age of how to eat healthy, but knowing mm. where things come from, mm -hmm. for me, it should be mandatory. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think kids don't stay enough time outside doing uh, imaginative uh, play. You know, everything is more structure. And I think that's one of the problems. Yeah. Too many, and now too much time in the computer, you know, yeah. to get their yeah. schooling or entertainment. Yeah. So the, the outdoors, and that's a beautiful segue to uh, reaffirm our mission at Brushwood, that the outdoors is, our, is an exemplary classroom. Mm -hmm. and, and also really extending our work such that children, families, older adults, young adults who don't have access to safe green spaces can have access. Because there are so many folks who've grown up in settings where they don't have access or it's just not safe to access that which might be nearby. And as we continue our work at Brushwood to make that available, it's, it's really powerful. Okay. Well, I realize we're coming up on the hour and I am super grateful to both of you uh, for giving this time and your expertise and your encouragement and inspiration. Uh, this has been really replenishing for me. <laughs> I'm going to be really selfish. <laughs> but honestly, even just this hour of reflecting on this, of seeing beauty in the photographs that you shared has done my soul good. And so I, I extend so much gratitude to both of you. and. To Brushwood, of course, for making this possible. Danny. As always, Martha, I am eternally grateful for you and your, <laughs> your service to our organization and to the world. Um, your work in palliative care, the care you extend to others just shines out of you constantly. I don't mm -hmm. think you even mean for it to happen. Um, get me over clubbed. <laughs> and Maria and Bill, thank you both so much. I mean, I now want to go and buy 70 more plants for my <laughs> now I have to catch up. <laughs> I'm, really I'm working on it. Yeah. I'm sorry, I know we had a couple questions come up towards the end that we just didn't have time to get to, but I encourage everyone to do some more research on the concepts brought up today. We, we shared a link in the chat about one of the resources Bill mentioned, um, you know, looking up resources on uh, restorative architecture and building practices, how you can integrate more natural elements into your home, um, what a great way to try and help keep us a little more grounded during this time of quarantine as we keep each other safe by, by staying inside. Well, again, for joining us, um, it was just such a wonderful conversation and I feel like I've, I've been galvanized to, to change my living, my living space to be a bit more, a bit more green. <laughs> and open Thank the you. window. <laughs> yes. And figure out if my windows give accurate air or adequate airflow, Bill. Now I have so many more questions about that. But we can talk offline. But thanks all. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And, and thank so you to everyone much. for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the future. And we hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye.